Hi, my name is Alexandra and I'm a bibliophile. So I have been gone for a while. I think my last video that I posted was over a year ago, so all of 2022 I took off from making video content. Yeah, I might talk more about that in the future, but I think everybody needs a break from the internet here and there. Obviously, I've never really been that consistent with my YouTube channel. One of my goals this year is, obviously, I actually, I, I, I want to be back at it. Here I am trying to be back at it. But with that in mind, I think my goal for this channel will be simply to post when I have something to say instead of falling like an arbitrarily set schedule that everyone says you're supposed to do in order to have a successful channel, yada, yada, yada. Same goes for my other social media, which I'm now on Storygraph because I have always hated Goodreads and I finally converted to Storygraph this year. So if you want to follow me, I am at a lovely jaunt there. I'm also on TikTok if you want to follow me there. But that's kind of the goal. That's kind of the deal. For today, I want to actually have kind of a general discussion around dark academia, or as I call it, tweed gone awry. And I'm going to kind of discuss what I think has to be there for it to really fit this genre. Uh, I want to talk about how it easily blends with other genres. And I'm going to talk about the four books that I have read in generally considered in the genre, which are, which is The Secret History by Donna Tartt, the Maidens by Alex Micheletis, If We Were Villains by M. L. Rio, and Ninth House by Lee Bardugo. Now, an early disclaimer, I DNF'd both If We Were Villains and Ninth House, and I kind of want to talk about them and some of the criticisms that I have of them. The other two I really enjoyed, and also kind of talk about, you know, how they fit into the genre and what they're doing and yada yada yada. So kind of a general dark academia discussion video. Okay, disclaimers. First of all, content warning. Because these books are dark, they have dark themes, they talk about <laughs> difficult subjects. So um, content in these books include murder, sexual assault, incest, drug use, alcohol use, lots of other things. If you haven't read them yet, I would just suggest looking up sort of the content if you think that some of those topics might be difficult for you to read because they are heavy. And since we are going to be talking about them in depth, I will be discussing those things in this video as well. So if that's difficult for you to listen to or um, hear discussions about, go ahead and give this video a pass. Also a spoiler warning because I'm going to talk about these videos in depth, or the, <laughs> these videos, because I'm going to talk about these books in depth, I will be talking about some of th the things that would be considered spoilers, even up to reveals and that sort of thing. So if you do not want to be spoiled on these books, go ahead and give this video a pass. And finally, uh, I wanted to give another disclaimer, which is that Ninth House was uh, actually gifted to me by a very dear friend and even though I have some criticisms about that book that I want to share with you guys today it in no way negates the friendship and love that was imbued in the gift giving and then thirdly no fourthly these are just my opinions and I think you know the longer I read and the more I have criticisms about books and the more that I read deeply which has generally been my habit the more I just think these are just opinions about books. Okay, so let's get into the main genre concepts of dark academia. So it has to do with academia and it has to be dark. But getting under the hood a little bit, in my opinion, merely setting a book in an academic setting like a university, for example, um, does not satisfy the academia element to me. There's lots of books that are set in an academic environment. You've I mean, you could basically say that Hogwarts is set in an academic environment, or Harry Potter is set in an academic environment because Hogwarts is a school, and that's where all of the main action takes place for the bulk of those stories. But we know that that's not a dark academia book, even though there's dark stuff that happens in it, even though there's fantasy elements. It's because, like, the action of the book and the characters of the book and kind of, like, what's going on has to be grounded in this academia the main plot points of the book have to be surrounding the fact that 
academia is happening, that, that maybe it's the academia itself that creates the darkness. And in fact, it's oftentimes examining and criticizing systems of elite education or elitism in general in the United States. It really opens the door for that kind of conversation. Um, and then obviously the dark elements are also key. So it gives us, like I said, that opportunity to kind of examine our relationship to systems of power, their corruption, and our complicity with them. First, let's talk about The Secret History, because The Secret History is the first book that I read that really fits into this genre, and I think it's also the most straightforward in the way that it fits into this genre. First of all, it's more of a literary style. It doesn't really genre blend with anything else. Uh, our first person narrator is a character named Richard. Um, he's from a lower middle class family on the West Coast, and then he moves out East to attend a liberal arts university in Vermont. And he gets into this exclusive classics department, which, you know, if you're in that department, then you just take all of those classes together with the same students, because the head professor sort of says like, oh, I want you to be on this track. And the students that he gets paired up with, they're clearly from a much higher socioeconomic class than he is from. He sort of ex experiences this like cultural difference between the East and the West in the United States. And as Richard gets a more, uh, gets to know these kids more and more, he gets a more alluring glimpse into the kind of wealth and privilege that they experience. And his desire to sort of be on the inside, a lot of times you have a character who is an outsider looking in on these elite situations, and his desire to be on the inside um, is basically strained as he uncovers the dark secret that they're hiding. And there's like this profound tension placed on him, like will he remain loyal to his new friends, or will he, you know, tell the truth about what's actually going on behind the scenes? Will he be complicit in the system that protects privileged people and that he ultimately wants that same kind of benefit and protection from? Or will he give up the goose? That is sort of the tension that is put forth in the story. And that's kind of the ultimate kind of har harbinger that this is something is harbinger the right word? This is the ultimate sign that this is what dark academia is, is that it has to do with an academic situation, there's something dark going underneath, and it gives us this opportunity to have questions about class, about elitism, about systems of power. Okay, I'm probably going to say that 10,000 times in this book, because that's what dark academia is about. Okay, If We Are Villains brings a similar tension. In this story, we follow a group of students at an elite theater school, which specializes in Shakespeare. They are about to start their third year, which is their make it or break it year. It's understood within the narrative that like, if you make it through your third year at this university, you can write your own ticket as far as your acting career goes. So it's very, very high pressure. Um, at the same time, we also know that there's a murder that's on the back of the book. And so um, it kind of brings that same tension as the secret history. What are you willing to do to remain complicit with a system that would reward you generously in the same way that it rewards this other privileged class that you're trying to be a part of, trying to be included in. I ended up DNFing this book, so I want to go into the criticisms of it because it's sort of adjacent to dark academia, but I think it's helpful for later discussions that we're going to have, which is it's kind of a pet peeve of mine. The way that this story is set up is that the main professor who is teaching them in their third year puts a ton of like pressure on them and pushes them AKA is abusive to students in order to help them, uh, you know, realize their true talent and kind of like bring it out from the depths of who they are. And like, it's based on this false idea that we have that artists have to suffer in order to make great art for greatness to come out. And so then it justifies abusive behavior on the part of like mentors and teachers or things or directors or whatever the case may be in order to get these wonderful performances or these, you know, wonderful works of art or whatever the case may be. You know, if you know anything about someone like uh, our, um, Alfred Hitchcock, this was a technique that he used to get like these raw performances out of actresses, his, especially his lead actresses that he was both obsessed with and tortured. This is an idea or a theme that's explored like in Black Swan. I also watched another movie, the title of which escapes me, but it was about a jazz drummer and his mentor basically does the same thing and they kind of get to the point where they have like a mental breakdown, but it's like they achieve their high performance rate right before they're kind of like, 
you know, completely broken. I really, really dislike that because I think that that's not true. And I think it perpetuates that false narrative that we have around artists and, and how art is made. And so, <laughs> so I don't like it. And that's something that comes up with me very often is like, no matter how f fantasy based the story is, I kind of want it to tell like capital T truth about humanity. I want it to reveal um, and explore you know, about human nature, about, it doesn't have to be happy things. It can be dark things like what we see here. I don't need it to be happy. In fact, I have a tendency to prefer the dark and the tragic and the whatever, but like, I want it to be grounded in reality. Um, and I don't like it when people use books or forms of entertainment to like perpetuate myths <laughs> that we have in our culture that are sort of like unexamined. When it contradicts my worldview, I guess, like I have a really hard time just sitting there and being like, oh, isn't this fun? Like, let's watch a teacher abuse children. Like, no, I don't, I don't want to do that. And, and, it's, and especially when the book sort of seems to justify it with this false view. So one of the other things to really think about with dark academia is that when you are talking about class and elitism, especially in the United States and in England, which is where most of these books are set, it gives you the opportunity to talk about race as well, because these things are intertwined in our culture. And so you have these opportunities. In the case of Ninth House, which I have right here, um, you have a character who is mixed race. So she is, I believe, white and Hispanic. And um, so you, I, like it's right there for the picking, you know, you have this opportunity to talk about something deeper and more meaningful. And unfortunately, I think that's an opportunity that this book uh, misses. But before you go more fully into Ninth House, I just kind of wanted to bring that up as a concept. Let's talk about the Maidens first. So The Maidens is structured differently because it's sort of blending the genre of dark academia with suspense. Anyway, The Maidens also sort of switches our main character perspective. So in this one, instead of having sort of like your typical outsider who's the same age as the peer group trying to get on the inside, what are they willing to do to get the benefit? We do have a main character who is older. So our main character is actually the mother figure of the character who's in university. And although in many ways this character does feel disconnected from society or alienated in a lot of areas and always has felt like a bit like an outsider, that's less of an element for the tension that this story creates um, because she's already graduated from university. She's now going back to the same university, which is where her niece goes to school because her niece's roommate has been murdered. So she is going there to sort of comfort her niece, to support her niece, but also to like kind of see if she can figure out what's going on. And she kind of gets wrapped up into the investigation from there. When she is going through this process of investigating, she's immediately suspicious of the professor of the classics department because he has gathered around himself this group called the Maidens, which is sort of like an inner circle of students. And he has special classes with them that are different and separate from the rest of the university. They're set apart as this elite group and they're all really attractive and have connections to powerful people. So it's like obviously very, very suspicious, right? She herself isn't necessarily feeling like pressure in the same way that some of the other characters that we've looked at have because it's not peer pressure, but she's obviously alarmed by the complicity of this elite institution with something that's obviously not good is happening, right? These three stories are deeply embedded in academia. The action of the secret history could not have happened if it weren't for the university and, and particularly the way the classics program is structured. Um, and the, our main character wouldn't be able to get to know these kids from this elite world if he wasn't at this university in this program. Uh, and part of the exploration of darkness is inspired by their professor who is interested in the Eleusian mysteries, which is part of the cult of like Demeter and Persephone, although it probably even goes back even earlier before the sort of Greek gods were even solidified, maybe just to like local deities or even, anyway, it's a, it's a whole area of academic study and it's still actually very mysterious. So we still don't really know 
what the ceremonies consisted of. We know that there were certain occult practices that happened. The same is true of if we were villains, what happens in the story is a direct result of the Shakespearean program that they're in. In the case of the Maidens, the classics professor, interestingly, is also interested in the Elysian Mysteries, and that's sort of at the core of what his whole deal is. And all of the victims of murder are part of his inner circle. And so the exploration of darkness and academia are fully intertwined. Okay, so on to the ninth house. Um, and so I'm kind of point, pounding this point home of like how the darkness and academia need to be fully intertwined as like a functional necessity of the plot and main action of the novel because I don't think Ninth House is a dark academia novel. I think it is an urban fantasy novel novel that has so yeah I don't think it's dark academia at all actually. The secret societies happen to be associated with Yale but they're not necessarily associated with any academia or degree or department. They're distinguished by their different types of magic but again this isn't tied to anything academic in particular. Um, you could very easily change the setting without disrupting the action of the novel for example. If you decided, oh, I want to send it in like New Orleans and give it like a voodoo hoodoo magic feel, it would change the flavor of the the vibes of the novel, but it wouldn't change like the actual functioning of the novel or the functioning of the plot. You could also set it like in Appalachia and rely on folk music, folk music, folk magic for sort of the flavor of fantasy that you're dealing with. But because the setting is so loosely tied to the action of the novel, it would be very easy to transplant, which is why I'm not, which is, you know, the basis of my argument. And again, the reason I say it's urban fantasy is because it's like, you know, the magical world is overlaid upon our real world. It's a real world setting. It's not a portal. She's not transported somewhere. It's not taking place in some totally different fantasy realm like Middle Earth or something like that. So it's urban fantasy. I do have some criticisms of Ninth House, and we're gonna go from like most petty to like most important. And so most petty is that the first name of the main character, she goes by Alex, but her first full name is Galaxy, Ga Alexi. And I think that is <laughs> so dumb. It is so dumb. Oh my gosh, I scoffed when I read it. Like I immediately posted online that I thought, like I couldn't, I like still can't help myself. Like I feel it like in my bones of like thinking that is the dumbest name I've ever heard. It's just absolutely annoying. Next criticism is um, Lee Bardugo's attempt to transition into adult novels. So she's written all YA novels previously. This is her first adult novel, but it's not an adult novel. It's just a YA novel with very like adult themes and content in it. It's structured just like a YA novel. I, like I don't really know how to say it except for like I feel <laughs> in my bones like it is a YA novel. Yeah, if it didn't have like the mature content, it would just be considered probably new adult, but even then if you, it's just because she aged up the character from like 16 to 19, right? I actually don't know exactly how old Galaxy is, but I'm assuming like 1920. And again, this, there is, I'm not criticizing writing for a particular audience, whether it be YA or new adult or adult, that's not the criticism. The criticism is that like just slapping mature content into a story that has like the vocabulary, the sentence structure, the writing style, the pacing, even the way it explores concepts. Conceptually, it's in a very YA approach. It's for that level of reader. So just like slapping mature content into a novel that otherwise is structured exactly the same way as a YA novel does not an adult novel make. In fact, most of the adult novels that I read don't have this type of mature content in it, like explicit sexual content or drug use. That's not what makes an adult novel an adult novel. It's just, and in fact, like the content within it, most adult novels is not inappropriate for like a 16 year old to read. They just have a different writing level and, and they may or may not like deal with their meaningful concepts in a more sophisticated way. I, I prefer that they do. I prefer adult novels that do. So that was another 
like annoying thing about Ninth House. But criticism number three is the one that's most important to me and the one that I'm going to spend the most time talking about. And I think this also is something to keep in mind for like if you're writing grim dark fantasy. Not that authors should listen to me, I'm just a person on the internet who's never written a book myself. This is just my opinion. But like I think dark academia and grim dark fantasy have a potential pitfall that they can fall into, which I think Ninth House does <laughs> in a textbook but horrible fashion, um, which is like you're dealing with dark content. Bad stuff happens to characters in these stories, but you're creating something that is essentially for entertainment purposes. In fact, true crime podcasts have to deal with like this problem, which is like you're writing about dark stuff, but the content you're creating is for entertainment purposes. So it's important the way that you go about talking about the dark stuff that happens and how you handle the disturbing stuff that's part of your piece of entertainment, right? And so one of the most important things for me is that it's grounded in the story. And what I mean by that is that it has consequences on the page. Like in the case of like the secret history, we have a group of young people who attempted to recreate the Elysian mysteries, which means that they whipped themselves into a frenzy. They took some psychotropic like mushrooms and like had basically an orgy and then attacked a man like a beast, ultimately like killing him in a like horrible fashion, right? They are completely distraught by this event. They are filled with confusion, with shame. They're, the, the whole relationships between all the characters are filled with like profound tension. It has drastically really affected their relationships with each other. They're trying to keep it a secret. They're not sure if they can trust the new guy in the group, yada, yada, yada. So this event is like the chaotic, chaotic swirl around which the rest of the novel takes place. Let's take a look at the dark content that, that just happens to Alex, our main character, in the ninth house. And I didn't even finish the book. I only got to chapter seven. So in the first chap seven chapters, which is not a very long part of the book, this is what happens to Alex. First, she's raised by a single mother that she has a kind of difficult and strained relationship with. Her mother doesn't really understand her. So there's a little bit of alienation, a lack of secure bonding there between herself and her mom. Number two, she's seen ghosts for as long as she can remember and these ghosts are like sixth sense style in the sense that like the way that she sees them is the way that they died. So some of these are very grisly and disturbing, you know, situations that these ghosts are in. Number three, in early elementary school, she indicates that she's been exposed to male nudity on multiple occasions by these ghosts. Number four, also in elementary school, she describes a memory of witnessing a naked male ghost touching himself while watching children play at research. Um, number five, she really struggles to make friends because of all of this trauma, so she's quite isolated. Number six, in junior high, on the, this is where we get into disturbing, really disturbing content. Um, on the first day that she gets her period, she has her first physical encounter with a ghost. It's not explained in the book why this is the moment where get, ghosts are able to physically interact with her. All previous times, it's like they are, you know, a non-physical presence, right? She can pass through them. They don't have an ability to touch her or push her or anything like that. But on this occasion, on this first occasion, a male ghost approaches her in a public um, bathroom and rapes her, right? And so while she is like screaming and crying for help in this situation, this event is witnessed by her, a teacher. Who, they're on like a field trip or whatever and her only friend comes rushing into the bathroom as well, who herself is a young girl. She's also in junior high, right? Number seven, she's teased at school by this event and her friend gossips about her. And I want to pause here and talk about this, um, about because this is again not grounded in the story, because this book very much leads us to sort of like judge the other little girl for not being a good friend to our main character, Alex, when the reality is if this had actually happened, like she would be traumatized too. Shoot, the teacher would be traumatized by the whatever it is that they saw, which they can't see the ghost, so they can't really tell what's going on, but it's horrible, right? And I really also dislike this sense of like, this framing reinforces the idea that empathy or compassion is a zero-sum game, that 
you know, there's almost only so much to go around and we have to decide who's the most worthy. And if in any way you don't act perfectly, you're now lo no longer like the perfect victim. You're not worthy of empathy. So in this case, like the case that I'm making is like Alex is set up as the perfect victim so we can have empathy for her, but her best friend in junior high is set up to be not the perfect victim because she gossips about her. And so now we don't have empathy for her best friend. I just don't like that concept and unfortunately I think it is the way that people think about things in the real world and that's where victim blaming comes in a lot so I just don't like the way in which like the worldview of this novel promotes that type of thinking. It's one of those things where it's like this is where I talk about like I don't like it when a book doesn't talk about capital T truth in a way like I think it's immoral like it's a very like I don't like it perpetuating these types of ways of thinking about the world through its narrative and the way it reinforces the way we should judge different characters on the page. <sighs> Number eight. So yes, <laughs> this girl still has more suffering to do deal with at the hands of the author. At a certain point it's just like I'm just watching this person be traumatized in a variety of ways that you can think of. It's like sort of like trauma porn or something. Anyway, eight. Alex discovers drug that like drugs and alcohol help her to escape from her visions of ghosts. So she just becomes like a normal person at that point, as opposed to when she's sober. She's still in middle a middle middle schooler at this point. So she starts using both regularly and consistently from like middle school and on. She eventually becomes a drug dealer and drops out of high school at some point. The timeline isn't really clear or specific in the story. And then number 10, we know that something horrible happened to her that landed her in the hospital. This is sort of like the opening action of the, there's two different timelines going on in this book where it's the present timeline and then she's also like sharing memories and stuff from her past from when she was little. That's how you get all this information. So we know that she's found on the sidewalk next to her new best friend. She's horribly injured and her best friend is dead. They're both found naked um, and it is in the hospital room that she is approached by the secret society at Yale that sort of like kicks off the main action of this whole story. So we have one more major traumatic event that's not fully explored at this point in the book that happened right before the main action of the novel. Something really must, horrible must have happened, right? So, and. and and the problem, again, it's not grounded. The consequences to Alex are minimal. She's a little shy and fearful, that's her personality, but she doesn't have the behavior or the inner world of someone who has gone through this level of trauma. There is no sense, even that she's trying to deal with her drug or alcohol addiction, she's like magically sober when we see her as she comes out of the hospital and is now at Yale. And then like on top of that, like, it, like, I, I, it just seems like convenience for the plot for her to move forward and it's like okay if drugs and alcohol are a part of her story like that's clearly her coping mechanism for dealing with having to see the ghosts in the first place but also like a lot of her trauma presumably she's dealing with it through these coping mechanisms but now she's not using either so how is she coping she hasn't been to any therapy as far as we know so she hasn't developed healthier coping mechanisms like she seems mostly fine she seems mostly fine <laughs> and then and then you have the audacity to tell me that you know even though this girl is on academic probation she's going to Yale and she's like getting through it an addicted high school dropout again this is not me casting judgment on someone and there's no reason to say that someone who hasn't had these types of experience couldn't succeed at Yale but like you would have to go through a great deal of healing and that sort of thing to be able to be in a position to succeed in an institution like Yale. And it's the healing part of this journey that is dropped out of this that makes it impossible to believe. So she has all these untold traumas who are like completely unresolved. So who in addition to going to classes is learning magic She's learning about the politics of all of these secret societies. And on top of that, like she is investigating a murder mystery that has happened at the beginning of this book. And like, not even a little bit, like she is the liaison between the actual police and these secret societies. Like I could not suspend my disbelief for that. I'm sorry, there is, there is no suspension bridge in existence that could get me from my reality to whatever is going on in the ninth house. It's completely it's so far from anything real that it's absurd. It's absolutely absurd. 
so for that reason, it's annoying. But I kind of want to back this up and kind of talk more in general about the way that we talk about victimhood in stories and how we kind of it just really gets under my skin. So if you're going to include trauma events in stories, especially when they happen to our main character, we have a first person narrator. So we are inside the inner world of this character. You, you need to be able to write the effects of that trauma event. You need to be able to write the ripple effects of that, at least on the main character, let alone on the community at large, because these things never affect just one person. So an inability to like imagine or articulate or explore how that would affect a character and merely you, it makes it means that it gets reduced to a plot device. Something that important and that real that happens to real people in real life becomes a plot device in your book because it's convenient for your story. It's, it's very disrespectful, I feel like, to the people who have actually experienced things like this. And I have a hard time <laughs> like really putting it into words, but it feels like this type of content is just being used, not being respected, not being explored, not being understood, not written about in order to be understood or to, to engender a broader understanding in the reader, right? It's just dropped on the page to engender a certain response for the reader. Like I said, there's like a certain lie inside, embedded inside of the worldview of if we were villains, which is, like I said, this idea that artists have to suffer in order to produce great art. Therefore, it's perfectly justifiable to, for mentors and teachers to impose suffering on their talented students. The lie of Ninth House, and it's a very common one for this modern era, is that a, the only way to be interesting or worthy of being a main character is that you have to be a victim in some way. And B, that compassion is a zero-sum game. And so the only people worthy of compassion are those who have been most victimized. And I think what that lie is like sort of purporting is like it's almost like Alex doesn't have a victimhood mentality because she just doesn't even deal with her victimization. But it's almost like the novel itself imposes a worldview that supports a victimhood mentality that requires us to enter into um, agreeing with victimhood mentality in order to judge characters the way the novel is leading us to judge characters, like to agree with the way that the narrative is framed. And I think that's really bad. <laughs> I think that's really bad. So this has been a long journey. So in conclusion, I kind of want to ask you a couple of questions to discuss in the comments below, which is one, do you think that a novel for a novel to really be considered dark academia, um, that it needs to be deeply grounded in academia or is merely setting it in an academic setting enough to cross that bridge to get that marker? Uh, number two, do you think that if an author includes heavy, mature content, that they're obligated to explore the ramifications of that content in the world of the novel? And number three, do you think we have a problem of like a main character problem where it's like, it's not like they have the victimhood mentality, but they're created from that worldview and that that victimhood mentality is seeded into the moral framework of the novel and it sort of unconsciously perpetuates that this is an appropriate way to view the world? That's a more complicated question, but do you get what I'm saying? Um, so I'd love to hear your thoughts on those three questions or anything else that I brought up in this story. And until next time, my name is Alexandra and I'm still a bibliophile.